calling us to experience your love uh, in the season of Christmas. Lord, we are undeserving of your love, and yet you give it to us freely. Uh, Father, I thank you for Jesus. I pray that we would focus on him. We would focus on his sacrifice. We would focus on his birth, and we would know, we would know that you are God. We love you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I graduated college in 2011, but I still have nightmares of college. Uh, it, it happens frequently. It, it's like this, this nightmare where I walk into a classroom, and it's, it's, it's the final. It's, it's like the, the, the last final. And in the dream, I, 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 for whatever reason, I know I haven't gone to a single class and I look at the final, and I know none of the questions. I don't even understand what's going on. And it's this stress of what do I do because I, I'm in this situation where I have to take this final, and it's a class I've never taken before, and, and how am I going to get out of this? And it's this stress that, and again, I, I've been out of college now for a long time, and it's, it's still, I get these dreams, on, actually relatively frequently, um, where I'm, I'm stressing out about this test. And it's so interesting to, to kind of re, re, uh, recollect what's going on in the dream and, and many times what I end up doing in the dream, which I did in real life, was pray to God and say, God, let there be a curve. And, 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 and I remember doing this even in college. There was um, a, a calculus class that I took that the, question, the, the, the test was five questions. And I wasn't used to that. I was used to um, having lots of questions so that you can miss some and still, still be okay. But in this particular calculus class, um, and it wasn't a dream, it was actually real. I went in to the midterm, it wasn't a final, but I went to the midterm, there were five questions, and I knew only two of the questions. I only, I only knew the answer to two. And I remember freaking out and just feeling so dejected and so, so bad, because I was like, I'm, I'm going to fail the class. Like, this is terrible. I, I, I only knew two of the answers, and then the other three, I only, I only got halfway through everything, and so I, I, don't, I don't know what to do. I was a freshman at the time, and what ended up happening, I got my, my test back, and for whatever reason, for, what, for whatever reason, it said 90. And I was like, how in the world did I get a 90 on this calculus test when I didn't know half the material? And then I found out my professor was really angry at us, the next class after we received our grades, he says, you know, I had to grade this test on a curve. So there were some of you that actually got some of the questions right, and there's some of you that got none of the questions right. So if you got any of the questions right, you got an A. And I, I was just sitting there, and I was like, you made the test too hard. It was, it, was, it was too hard of a test, and you didn't teach us well enough, and so it's your fault that it had to be on a curve. But at the same time, I was like, I'm, I'm just happy that I passed. I'm happy that I, I did decently. What I'm coming to see in the church, what I'm coming to see when it comes to religion, when it comes to being a Christian, is a lot of us think that God is going to grade us on a curve. There's a lot of us that we look to the people that we interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. And we think, to my, we think to ourselves, you know what, I may not ever measure up to the word of God. I may not ever measure up to Jesus. I may not even measure up to the disciples. I may not even measure up. I may not even measure up to the pastor, to the deacons. I may not even measure up to my children. I, I definitely don't measure up to my neighbor. But at least I'm better. At least I'm better than the people who are living in sin. At least I'm better than the people who are doing sinful acts out in the open. And what we end up doing is we, 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 we kind of soothe ourselves by going to church. And we soothe ourselves by, by doing religious things because we think God's going to grade us on a curve. I may not be super holy. I may not be super good, but at least I'm better than the people that don't, that don't do these things. And so hopefully when I, when I meet God and I see God and he, he puts me on that, that, that place of judgment and he's judging me, that he won't say, you're such a bad person. He'll say, at least you're better than everyone else. That God would grade us on a curve. Today is Christmas and it may, it may kind of throw you for a curveball that we're we're going to go into a Christmas sermon. But what I want to read for us is found in John chapter 1. 
you see the, the, the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the way they talk about the birth of Christ, it's about his physical birth. It's about him coming as a baby, him coming as a child, being born in a manger, a manger in Bethlehem, how it's fulfilling all these prophecies and how, how Jesus enters into the world in this humble way. That as we've talked about in the past, as Jesus is fulfilling these prophecies in these very specific ways, from the Old Testament, and now he is coming in as this young babe in a manger. I want us to focus a little differently. It's the way the, 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 the disciple, the apostle John, the way he writes about it isn't that Jesus came in the, form, in, in the form of a baby in the manger. He focuses on Jesus as God. And our church is called Lagos Central Chapel. And you can say Logos, you can say Lagos, you can say it however you want. But the word Lagos means word. And that's what we're going to see here today in the text. So if you would open up your Bibles with me to John chapter 1 or look on the screen behind me. I'm going to read for us the way John views Christmas. Verse 1, John, in, in John 1. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. And without Him, not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through Him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The way John is, is speaking about Jesus he doesn't say that Jesus began as this child in a manger. He doesn't begin with saying that Mary, the virgin, got pregnant, conceived, conceived by the Holy Spirit. The way John begins Jesus by saying, Jesus, the Word, was God. And, and, and the Word, the Word was there in the beginning of creation. And all things that were made are made through Him. That all things, all of creation was made through the wisdom of Christ that Jesus was the one to, to create us and mold us and to form us, that he is God. And it's from this, this idea that the word was God that we understand even this aspect of Trinity, that God exists equally as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And in this God, this one triune God, that there is this fellowship and this love and also, that Jesus is the one who is the light of man. And this light, this light, I want us to understand when it says Jesus is the light of man, is that there was so much darkness on the world, that as Adam and Eve had rejected God and wanted to go their own sinful ways and to rebel against God's authority and rule and reign, Jesus being the light of man was trying to lead humanity back to how things were supposed to be. That there was so much darkness and sin in the world that Jesus, being the light of man, came not to condemn, not to destroy, but to show humanity how it was meant to be, how we are supposed to live. But it says even here in John that the people then rejected him. They, they, they didn't accept him as Lord, as Savior. But instead, those that do accept him are born into new life. Not of flesh, not of by blood, not of the power of men, but they're born into new life by God. If I can explain this, and I, I really want us to understand the importance of this. 
It all leads to this idea of the Word becoming flesh. I, I, I think God wanted humanity. He wanted us. He wanted humans to live a certain way. And not because he's this strict God that, that, that is, is so unreasonable, is so mean, is so angry with thunderbolts of lightning and, and ready to throw it down on us for making any mistake. I, I truly believe that Jesus, being God, created us so that we would live lives of light, so that we would live lives of purpose and of joy and of passion, to have our, our whole beings just feel, this is why I'm created. But what happened was that we fell into rebellion. We fell into darkness. And like I was saying before, what ends up happening is this. Because we all live in darkness, and we, we, we hear the word, we hear what Jesus desires for us. And let me break it down to you. If you've never heard what Jesus desires for us or what Jesus commands to you, his whole ministry was hinged on one idea. His whole ministry was hinged on one command, and that command was to love one another and to love God. It, it, it's a single command, but with two parts. That the only command that Jesus gave to his disciples, the only commandment, was love each other and love God. So all of the sayings and teachings of Jesus were just different ways and different perspectives and different applications on how to fulfill this great commandment. So let's not try to convolute and make what Jesus says into this high and lofty thing. It's not complicated. And I think even the children can understand that Jesus' single command is to love one another and to love God. That is all Christianity is all about. But let me explain to you something. If that was a test, if the, if, if the test that God is, is giving us, that he's putting before us, is love each other, and love me. I guarantee you we would all fail. Because none of us, none of us are able to do that with our whole heart. Because we have this innate desire not to love others or love God. We have this innate desire to love ourselves. We have this innate desire to do what we want. I don't, I don't want to do what God wants me to do. I don't want to do what other people want me to do. I want to do what I want to do. And so what happens is this. Because we live in darkness, people become more and more selfish. But as Christians or as people that are in the church and very religious, we've learned, hey, maybe God will grade this test on a curve. Maybe God will have mercy on me because I'm better than my neighbor. I, I love him and I love others better than the person next to me. So maybe, even though I'm not perfect, even that I don't do everything the way I'm supposed to, maybe God will grade on a curve, and instead of getting a failing grade, I'll at least pass. I won't get the A, I won't get the B, but maybe I'll get like a C, a C minus, and I'll pass. And then I'll, he'll enter me into heaven saying, my good and faithful servant, you, 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 you fed the homeless, and, and you, you went to church every Sunday, so congratulations, you get into heaven. Yeah, maybe, that, maybe God's like that. He'll grade us on a curve. I want to explain to us something very important. Anytime, anytime you hate someone, anytime you fail to love someone, anytime you, you have that anger or you have that hatred, Jesus himself explains that it's as, it's as close to murder it's similar to murder. It's the same thing as killing someone. Let me explain to you. If you've even looked at someone in an in a, in a un, ungodly way and, and you have this lust in your heart, you've committed adultery. Jesus was trying to explain to the people he was serving that God doesn't grade on a curve. That God is very strict in his grading policies. Because why? He's just. He's fair. And see, a good God is going to look at the laws that he's made, and he's going to grade accordingly. He's going to say, you, you, you failed. You failed to meet our expectations. Here's the beauty. When the word became flesh, when Jesus became flesh, he was doing something miraculous. He was doing something gracious. He was doing something that that I can only explain in a lifetime. 
that I want to explain to you every single week is that when the word became flesh, Jesus said that, <laughs> that his seat as being God that even though he, he was God, that he is God, that he decided to humble himself and, and turn into and become a child and become a man and to live and to die for us. And the reason why he had to die is because we fail to love one another. It's because we fail to love God. So he took the, the failing grade that we deserve. When, G when you see Jesus on the cross and you, see, you hear about him being hung on the cross and being nailed to the cross, we have to understand it's not because he failed this test of loving one another and loving God. He didn't fail. He passed with flying colors. He aced it. In Jesus' lifetime, he never hated anyone. He loved everyone, and he always loved God. And so when we see Jesus hanging on the cross, it's because of our failure to love. It's because of our failure to do the one commandment that God gave us. But something miraculous even more happened. Something miraculous happened is that after he died, he was raised from the dead three days later. As, G as God's seal of approval to say to us that now those of you who worship and, and, and believe in this Jesus, now you are children of God. Welcome to be born into new life. And it's this idea that, that still doesn't make too much sense to me. But I'm beginning to at least make an analogy. And it's not a perfect analogy. But this analogy is this. Is that God didn't change the test. The test is still exactly the same. It's to love each other and, and to love God. That's, that's, the, that's the only questions on the test that you have to answer in your life. But now, God has made it a group project. And, and I want to explain to you like this. is when you're in a group project, it doesn't matter who does the work. It just matters that the work is done. And let me explain to you that Jesus in his life, in his ministry, that he aced that test perfectly. And he explains, if you follow me, if you take up your cross and follow me and believe in me, it's like he's saying we can take this test together. And God does not look at your righteousness. He doesn't look at your mistakes and your failures. He looks at Jesus. And when we, just, when, we, when we meet God and he says, you messed up in this way, in this way, in this way, in this way, these are all of your sins, that what happens is, is if we believe in Jesus, God says, well, you still got an A. You still got a perfect grade. Because someone in your group did all the work. Because someone in your family, someone did the work that was necessary and someone went in and corrected all the mistakes that you made and all the times you were hateful, all the times you were lustful, all the times you rebelled and you were, you were angry and you were bitter that there was someone in your group that went in and, and, and they fixed all the mistakes. And his name is Jesus. See, in this way there is no comparison to your right or to your left. See, I believe that as a church, we're all in the same group. But I hope and pray that you're not relying on my, on my holiness. That you're not relying on me being a holy person because I guarantee you I will fail you. Because I, I am not able to ace the test that God has placed for us. I, there are times where I'm not loving. There are times where I don't love God. There are times where I fail. So this, this church doesn't revolve around me. It doesn't revolve around you. It doesn't revolve around the leadership or the various ministries we have. The reason why we are gathered is because there's someone in our group that is perfect. And there's someone in our group that's willing to correct all of our mistakes. There was someone in our group that was willing to die for our mistakes. That, that while we deserve the failing grade, that he took the failing grade for us. And God... And God accepts it. See, the beauty of Christmas, the beauty of Christmas is, is that we celebrate the coming of Christ. And the coming of Christ is so important for you and for me. Because while we were still sinners, God loved us. That while we were still sinners, while we were deserving of this failing grade, because we mess everything up, because we're so, we're so preoccupied with ourselves, we're so preoccupied with our selfishness and what our desires are, that while we were still sinners, God sent his only son to die for us 
so that now we can live under his righteousness. And so you know what? Being in, in a group, you know, doing a group project, again, I really don't like group projects, but I'm learning more as I'm in the church. It's like being in a group project. Being in a group project and knowing Knowing that you got a passing grade. Knowing that you're going to ace it because there's someone in your group that does everything the right way. There's a, there's a freedom that comes with it. There's a freedom that comes with being in that kind of group where one person in your group is going to do all the work. The freedom is, is that now you are free to live how you choose. And I'm saying this. You are free to live however you want. But I would hope and I would pray that as there's someone in your midst who lives the perfect life, that we would follow his example. There was another time where um, I was in, when I was in college, <laughs> it was a chemistry class, and I remember studying really hard for the final, and there was a person next to me that was, um, that was taking the test, one of my friends, and we were sitting next to each other, and I was, I was really stressed because I was trying to, um, <laughs> I was trying to do, do well on this final. And, and they were next to me, and they were just, you know, chill. They were, they were acting like it was no big deal. Um, they, they barely studied. It was, it was, they didn't really care about the test. And I remember thinking to myself, like, I've worked so hard to make sure that I do well in this test. How can you just sit there and pretend like this test doesn't matter? I think as they were going through the test, they were, they were doing the questions very well and they were doing everything well, but there was no stress um, about them. I was stressed out like crazy because I was like, if I don't get a, I, I calculated, if I, I needed like an 85 to get an A in the class. So I was like, if I, if I get an 85, then I get an A. If I don't, then I get, a, I get a B and, you know, life's over. But they were next to me and they were like, eh, it's whatever. And they were just taking the test. But, I mean, they were still doing very well. I could, I could tell, you know, th- like they were actually thinking. It wasn't like they were just blowing it off. And I asked them afterwards, like, how could you be so relaxed? And, and, and they said something to me that got me really angry. They're like, oh, I was exempt from the final. And I don't know if you know what that means. What that means is, regardless of what they got on the final, that they already got an A in the class. And I asked them, why did you take the final? And the person said, because I wanted to see how well I would do. Because I wanted to see what my grade would be. I want to explain to you something. Being a Christian, believing in Jesus, means that in life you get an A. And that you're exempt from any final. That when we meet God on judgment, when we meet God and, he, and he's going to review our life and, and going to decide whether we are worthy of living eternally with him or we are damned to hell, you're exempt. Because why? Because Jesus already died for you, and if you believe in him, you're exempt from the final. So now the life that you live, you can live it the way you want without any stress. I hear these days that people say that they're very spiritual, but they're not religious. And I hear this all the time. I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. Christians should be the least religious people ever. The reason why we should be the least religious is because there is nothing to be religious about. Jesus is the one who has lived the perfect life for us. So brother, sister, you are exempt. But the question is, is how you live your life now. Do you live your life living in the darkness that you've been saved from? Or do you live in light as God intended, that God desired, that he knew as your father that you would live a life in light, being fulfilled and being led by him in all things, that you would follow him and have your life just be energized and full of passion and joy because it's doing what your father who loves you so much has asked. This Christmas season, what I ask so deeply and dearly to our congregation is let us not act like we're taking a test before God. Let us understand that we live in this freedom under Jesus who came in the form of a child who is the greatest gift of all that now you are exempt and so now let's work. Now let's study hard. Let's let's do good things, not for the grade, but because we actually want to follow Jesus. And you're going to make mistakes. I'm going to make mistakes. And so when we make mistakes, let us forgive one another. Let us stop letting it get so, so much bitterness and hatred towards one another. I'm sorry, the person on your left and the right, they're going to offend you. They're going to hurt you. Jesus' call to you is to forgive them. Not because they deserve forgiveness, but because you already passed. 
because there's no judgment on you. And so forgiving them is, should be easy because there's someone who already died for that sin. There's someone who already covered that mistake. I really want to see that kind of joy this Christmas season. Let there not be the spirit of legalism that people have to do a checklist and make sure they do all these things so that they would be better than their neighbor, so that God would grade on the curb and give them an A. Let us rest in this truth that Jesus Christ is the only reason why we are accepted in God's house. And it's only by him, it's only because of him that we celebrate Christmas as a time of gift giving as a time of opening presents, because the greatest present of all isn't the toys that we get, isn't the, isn't the nice, shining things that we get. The greatest gift of all is knowing that in our lives, God looks at us and says, well done, my good and faithful servant, because his son was a good and faithful servant. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you don't grade on a curve. I thank you that you are just and that you are, you, are, you are wise and you are holy. That sin is sin to you and you do not waver on that. But Father, I thank you that you sent Jesus to die for us. That you sent him on Christmas. You sent him on, on this, this, this earth to die for us. So that we would not live by our own righteousness, but we would live by his. Father, I pray that we would still try we would still attempt to do the commandment that you've called on us that we would love one another and we would love you father i pray that you would convict us to do this that much more this christmas season that you would convict us to do this that much more in the new year father i pray that our church would be would be known as people who love who love aggressively who love sacrificially not because we want to do it but because your son showed us how father i thank you for this congregation and I pray that you would continue to speak to us and convict us of what we need to do. We love you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Flesh, and dwelt among us, and lived for us, and laid down his life so that we may live eternally with you. We thank you for him. So as we open our gifts and love one another, I pray that we would also love you. That, Father, as we attempt to live by the greatest commandments, that we would do it knowing that we are already accepted, we are already in your family, and that the gift is free, but it was paid for by your blood. Father, I pray for this congregation. I pray for everyone in here that they would experience your love this holiday season, that they would experience your sacrifice and just your desire for a relationship. Father, I pray that no matter how far we are from you, that we would not... We would not reject you, but instead we would welcome you into our homes and into our lives. We, th we thank you for Jesus. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Thank you. And